Today, we observe some historic landmarks. The Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons was signed in London, Moscow, and Washington 50 years ago on July 1st. In Article 6, the parties pledged to pursue negotiations towards a treaty on nuclear disarmament. For 49 years, no such negotiations took place until last year, when non-nuclear nations of the United Nations could wait no more. Um, at a UN conference, they drew up a treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons and approved it on July 7th, 2017. By a vote of 122 to 1, none of the nine nuclear nations approved it. Um, they didn't even participate. You'll hear more on this treaty from one of our speakers, Jacqueline Cabasso, who helped create it. You may have written questions uh, for our speakers on the cards that we had at the, um, in the lobby, or right at the, at the desk. And um, if not, you can still fill out a card, and I'll pick them up in a little while, and during the Q&A section of our, of our forum, I'll, you know, I'll, pay, I'll select the ones that we will have time to address. The forum's official co-sponsors are the San Francisco Public Library. Yeah. And um, uh, especially the General Collections and Humanities Center and the Coalition for Nuclear Disarmament with 16 member groups, uh, the latest of which is Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. The other coalition groups are these. American Friends Service Committee, Berkeley Fellowship of Unitarian Universalists, Code Pink. Dominican Sisters of Mission San Jose, East Bay Peace Action, Ecumenical Peace Institute, Mount Diablo Peace and Justice Center, Physicians for Social Responsibility, San Francisco Bay Area Chapter, Shomer Shalom, Network for Jewish Nonviolence, Tri-Valley Cares, or Communities Against a Radioactive Environment, Veterans for Peace, Chapter 69, War and Law League, that's us, okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, let's see, and World Beyond War, um, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, who you might have seen in the lobby with their petition to get the United States on board with that um, UN treaty. Um, if you're not on the wall list, I hope you'll sign up in front. We have our own little sign-up sheet, not just the general one, but as you came in. It quotes founders of the, um, of the U.S., of, the, of the, you know, the United States, stating that under our Constitution, the decision to go to war is the exclusive province of Congress and not the President. Right. On our leaflet, it begins millions of people, including 122,000 Americans, have been killed in wars started illegally by U.S. Presidents since 1950. Harry Truman introduced nuclear terror to the world in 1945, Five years later, he set off the cult of the president as war maker by plunging the U.S. into a deadly, bloody three-year war in Korea without authorization by Congress, and later presidents imitated him. In March 1998, as President Clinton threatened to launch his third attack on Iraq, the War and Law League was born in San Francisco. In 1999, when, he, uh, when Clinton attacked Yugoslavia, Wall sent letters to all 535 members of Congress urging that it assert its constitutional authority and halt the president's bombings. The House of Representatives did reject his war, but Clinton ignored it, and he went to war under guise of a NATO member. Wall drafted a bill to stop executive war making, and Ron Paul, the Republican congressman from Texas, introduced it in March 2001. It died with 9-11. From the start, Wall opposed George W. Bush's wars on Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as Obama and Trump's escalations. Since 1999, Wall has proposed using the War Powers Resolution to stop any undeclared presidential wars through a special veto-proof resolution. One has just been introduced for the war in Yemen. The Wall website, warandlaw.org, please refer to that at your leisure, has exposed the illegality of the presidential war making from Truman to Trump. And Wall has sought congressional investigation of combat practices that violate international law, like bombing many civilians to get a few fighters, the use of drones, etc. Under Trump, civilian casualties have soared from illegal bombings in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and also Yemen, where he aids the Saudi monarchy in its war crimes against the civilian population. 
In 2016, Wall organized the Coalition for Nuclear Disarmament and brought the Australian physician Helen Caldicott to this very hall. At the front table, you may have picked up a brief summary of her talk and her appeal to Russia and the US to agree to abolish nuclear weapons. In a supposed democracy, should the control of nuclear weapons, the power to destroy all human life and all other life, rest in one man? Wall, Wall supports legislation in Congress to bar presidential first use of atomic weapons. Another peril is Trump's idea for so-called battlefield nukes, as strong as the ones dropped on Japan. Wall does, however, support an effort to improve relations with nuclear nations, particularly Russia, as we said in a letter published in both the San Jose Mercury News and the East Bay Times, Trump's meeting with Putin was a welcome first step back from the brink. Human survival demanded just such a relaxation of tensions. Well, this brings us to the, port, uh, to the forum. And I am proud to introduce Jacqueline Cabasso, our first speaker. She is the executive director of Western States Legal Foundation in Oakland, where she has worked since 1984. It's a public interest organization that monitors and analyzes US weapons and programs and policies, especially nuclear weapons. Since 1994, she has represented the foundation at negotiating and review sessions of both the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. In the summer of 2017, she represented the foundation at the United Nations when the Nuclear Prohibition yeah. Treaty was drawn up. In 1995, she co-founded the Abolition 2000 Global Network to eliminate nuclear weapons. She is the co-author of the 1985 book, Risking Peace, and has written for the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists and other publications. I give you Jacqueline Kamal. So I'd like to thank the Warren Law League for inviting me today, and thank you all for coming indoors on this very nice Sunday, and say hello to many old friends and some new ones. So, I want to start by just reminding us about the reality of nuclear weapons. On August 6, 1945, the United States unleashed the nuclear age, dropping a single atomic bomb small and crude by today's standards on Hiroshima, indiscriminately incinerating tens of thousands of children, women and men in an instant. By the end of the year, 140,000 people were dead. Over 90% of the doctors and nurses in Hiroshima were killed or injured by the bomb. Three days later, the US dropped a second atomic bomb on Nagasaki, incinerating another 70,000 people the final death toll in Nagasaki was calculated at 135,000. The A-bomb survivors, or Hibaksha, were condemned to live their lives in fear of radiation-induced cancers, and their children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren continue to face increased risks of health effects caused by genetic damage. As Takashi Hiraoka, then mayor of Hiroshima, testified to the International Court of Justice in 1995, quote, the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki shattered all war precedent. The mind-numbing damage these nuclear weapons wrought shook the foundations of human existence. During the 1980s, fear of nuclear war was by far the most visible issue of concern to the American public and people around the world. On June 21st, 1982, at the conclusion of the United Nations Special Second, second Special Session on Disarmament, a million people rallied in New York City's Central Park calling for the elimination of nuclear weapons. That same day, I was among more than 1,300 people arrested, nonviolently blockading the gates of the Livermore Nuclear Weapons Lab. All right. I think some of you. The Livermore Lab, little known to the public at that time, is one of the two US laboratories that have designed and developed all US nuclear weapons and continue to do so. The other is Los Alamos Lab in New Mexico, the site of the original Manhattan Project. Yet following the end of the Cold War, 
Nuclear weapons fell off the public's radar screen. It was almost as if the planet itself breathed a huge sigh of relief. Meanwhile, deeply embedded in the military-industrial complex, military planners and scientists at the weapons labs conjured up new justifications to sustain the nuclear weapons enterprise. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, Colin Powell, then chair of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, declared, quote, now listen to this, we no longer have the luxury of having a specific threat to plan for. What we plan for is that we're a superpower we are the major player on the world stage with responsibilities and interests around the world. Today, nearly 15,000 nuclear weapons, most in order of magnitude more powerful than the U.S. atomic bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 92% held by the United States and Russia, continue to pose an intolerable threat to humanity. How can we understand this number? General George Lee Butler, retired commander of U.S. Strategic Command, in 1999 stated, quote, it is imperative to recognize that all numbers of nuclear weapons above zero are completely arbitrary, that against an urban target, one weapon represents an unacceptable horror, that 20 weapons would suffice to destroy the 12 largest Russian cities with a total population of 25 million people, <coughs> one-sixth of the entire Russian population. And the dangers of wars among nuclear armed states are growing. On January 25th, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists moved the hands of its symbolic doomsday clock 30 seconds closer to the end of humanity. It is now set at two minutes to midnight, as close as it's ever been set since its inception in 1947. In moving the clock 30 seconds closer to the hour of the apocalypse, the Bulletin cited, quote, the failure of President Trump and other world leaders to deal with looming threats of nuclear war and climate change and declared, quote, the world is not only more dangerous now than it was a year ago, it is as threatening as it has been since World War II. On December 22nd, 2016, President-elect Donald Trump tweeted, quote, the United States must greatly strengthen and expand its nuclear capability until such time as the world comes to its senses regarding nukes. On July 7th of last year, I was at the UN to witness the adoption by the majority of the world's countries of historic treaty to prohibit the possession, development, testing, use, and threat of use of nuclear weapons. The vote by 122 to 1 unambiguously demonstrates that, to, that most of the world, at least by one measure, has indeed come to its senses regarding nuclear weapons. But I must note that the majority of the world's population lives in nuclear-armed countries or countries under the U.S. nuclear umbrella. The Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, or BAN Treaty, opened for signature at the UN on September 20th, 2017. Once 50 nations have ratified or acceded to it, it will enter into force for those countries. As of today, 67 countries have signed, 19 have ratified. But we stand at a nuclear crossroads in a sharply divided world. While the BAN Treaty represents the total repudiation of nuclear weapons by most of the states that don't possess them. The US and the eight other nuclear armed states boycotted the negotiations, along with Japan, Australia, South Korea, and all but one of the 28 NATO member states, the Netherlands, all countries, countries under the US nuclear umbrella. In a joint statement following vo the vote, the US, France, and the United Kingdom declared, quote, we do not intend to sign, ratify, or ever become party to the treaty. Meanwhile, nuclear tensions have risen to levels not seen for decades. Recently, our attention has been focused on the Korean Peninsula. While the Singapore summit appears to have greatly reduced immediate tensions, let us not forget that just months ago, U.S. and North Korean officials were positing ominous and illegal threats and counter threats of preemptive military strikes. Last year, Secretary of Defense, former Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta warned, quote, we have the potential for a nuclear war that would take millions of lives. While the ban treaty negotiations were taking place in the United Nations, two floors up in the same building, in an emergency meeting of the UN Security Council, the US was threatening military action against North Korea in response to his July 4, 2017 missile test. Fortunately, due largely to the skillful leadership and vision of South Korean President Moon Jae-in, 
with strong grassroots support from the candlelight revolution, a new diplomatic opening has appeared. Hopefully, the North-South and U.S.-North Korea summits will in the long term lead to a diplomatic resolution of the 68-year long crisis on the Korean Peninsula, including denuclearization on both sides. But the path ahead is very unsure. Korea isn't the only nuclear flashpoint. Derek Johnson, executive director of Global Zero, has assessed today's nuclear threat as, quote, an unprecedented moment in human history. The world has never faced so many nuclear flashpoints simultaneously, from NATO-Russia tensions to the Korean Peninsula to South Asia and the South China Sea and Taiwan. All of the nuclear armed states are tangled up in conflicts and crises that could catastrophically escalate at any moment. Tensions between the United States and Russia have risen to levels not seen since the Cold War, with the two nuclear giants confronting each other in Ukraine, Eastern Europe, and Syria, and an accelerated tempo of military exercises and war games, both conventional and nuclear, on both sides. And risky close encounters between Russian and US NATO forces have increased dramatically in the Baltic region and in Syria. The Trump administration's January 2018 national defense strategy portrays a shift from the war on terrorism to great power competition with a focus on Russia and China as strategic competitors. Donald Trump entered office with the US poised to spend more than $1 trillion over the next 30 years to maintain and modernize its nuclear bombs, warheads, and delivery systems, and the infrastructure to sustain the nuclear enterprise indefinitely. Russia, China, France, the UK, India, Israel, and Pakistan are all engaged in nuclear weapons modernization programs of their own. The Trump administration is now proposing huge increases in spending for nuclear weapons systems. Trump's nuclear posture review, released on February 2nd, sets forth in some detail plans to maintain, upgrade, and diversify the US nuclear arsenal. It carries forward existing plans for the replacement and upgrading of submarine-based, land-based, and air-based nuclear forces, while adding a new sea-based cruise missile. It also calls for near-term deployment of some low-yield warheads on submarine-based missiles. And it describes how nuclear weapons might be used in response to attacks of a non-nuclear nature, including cyber attacks against critical US infrastructure. In its entirety, this program which envisions U.S. reliance on extensive and diversified nuclear forces for decades to come is an anti-disarmament program. Mirroring the U.S. stance, Russian President Vladimir Putin in a March 1st speech boasted about new invincible Russian nuclear weapons and gave a detailed description complete with video animations of an array of new nuclear weapons delivery systems, including a nuclear-powered cruise missile and an underwater drone. While the personality at the top of the U.S. government changes from time to time, U.S. national security policy has been remarkably consistent in the post-World War II and post-Cold War eras, despite dramatically changed geopolitical conditions and very different presidential styles. Deterrence, which means the threatened use of nuclear weapons, the threatened use of nuclear weapons, has been reaffirmed as the cornerstone of US national security by every president, Republican or Democrat, since 1945, when President Truman, a Democrat, oversaw the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In October 2016, President Obama's UN ambassador, Robert Wood, condemned the ban treaty in the General Assembly, quote, advocates of a ban treaty say it is open to all, but how can a state that relies on nuclear weapons for its security possibly join a negotiation meant to stigmatize and eliminate them. So we must keep both realities, the promise of the ban treaty and the growing dangers of nuclear war fully in mind as we develop strategies to accomplish the urgent goal of a world without nuclear weapons. The ban treaty is the latest development in a long history of efforts by governments and civil society to rid the world of nuclear weapons. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, NPT, represents the only binding commitment in a multilateral treaty to the goal of disarmament by the nuclear armed states. Opened for signature in 1968, the treaty entered into force, thus becoming domestic US law in 1970. At the time, there were five nuclear weapon states, the United States, the United Kingdom, the Soviet Union, France, and China. Since then, India, Israel, Pakistan, and North Korea have developed nuclear weapons. 
These four states are the only countries outside the treaty. More countries have ratified the NPT than any other arms limitation and disarmament agreement. Article six of the NPT spells out the disarmament obligation binding on all state parties. Quote, each of the parties to the treaty undertakes to pursue negotiations in good faith on effective measures relating to cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date, that was 50 years ago, and to nuclear disarmament, and on a treaty on general and complete disarmament <coughs> under strict and effective international control. The NPT's initial duration was 25 years. In 1995, it was extended indefinitely. In connection with the extension decision, the U.S. reaffirmed its pledge to undertake, quote, the determined pursuit of systematic and progressive efforts to reduce nuclear weapons globally with the ultimate goal of eliminating those weapons. Also adopted was a call for universal adherence to the treaty and progress towards establishment of a Middle East zone free of weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear, chemical, and biological. This was directed primarily at Israel, an undeclared nuclear weapons state. Because of the special close relationship between Israel and the world's leading power, the US, leading nuclear power, the Middle East proposal has emerged in subsequent years as one of the areas of deepest division between the nuclear weapon states and the non-nuclear weapon states. The state's parties to the NPT meet every five years at a review conference to assess the implementation of the treaty. There's a preparatory committee conference that meets for two weeks in the three years leading up to each review conference. Non-governmental organizations, or NGOs, have had a significant presence at the 1995 NPT Review and Extension Conference and at each of the NPT Preparatory Committee and Review Conferences since, as well as at the ban treaty negotiations. At the 1995, I'm trying to get something okay, I have my timer right here. Okay. <laughs> At the 1995 Review and Extension Conference, NGOs from around the world came together to form the Abolition 2000 Global Network to Eliminate Nuclear Weapons, still going strong, which in its founding statement called upon all states to, quote, initiate immediately and conclude negotiations on a nuclear weapons abolition convention that requires the phased elimination of all nuclear weapons within a time-bound framework with provisions for effective verification and enforcement. The Abolition 2000 statement inspired an international consortium of lawyers, scientists, disarmament experts, and activists to draft a model nuclear weapons convention. Convention means treaty. That was submitted to the United Nations by Costa Rica in 1997 and circulated to member states as an official UN document. The model nuclear weapons convention prohibits the use, threat of use, possession, development, testing, deployment, and transfer of nuclear weapons and provides a phased program for their elimination under effective international control. The Model Nuclear Weapons Convention was updated in 2007 and submitted to the UN by the governments of Costa Rica and Malaysia. In July 1996, the International Court of Justice, the judicial branch of the United Nations and the highest court in the world on questions of international law, issued an historic advisory opinion on the illegality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons. The court unanimously concluded, quote, there exists an obligation to pursue in good faith and bring to a conclusion negotiations leading to nuclear disarmament in all its aspects under strict and effective international control. This is the authoritative interpretation of Article 6. In 1996, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution following up on the ICJ opinion calling for early commencement of multilateral negotiations leading to an early conclusion of a nuclear weapons convention prohibiting the development, production, testing, deployment, stockpiling, transfer, threat or use of nuclear weapons, and providing for their elimination. 115 countries voted in favor, and it has been adopted annually ever since, with a citation to the model nuclear weapons convention added in 2007 and a growing number of yes votes. Non-nuclear weapon states have long asserted that the nuclear armed states have failed to make good on their nuclear disarmament obligations under Article 6 of the NPT. Indeed, this was one of the main motivations in negotiating the ban treaty. The United States, the UK, and France claim that the ban treaty undermines the NPT. How is that? But proponents of the treaty say it strengthens the NPT by providing an implementation mechanism for Article 6. 
The next NDT Review Conference will be held in 2020, the 75th anniversary of the U.S. atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Last November, the Norwegian Nobel Committee awarded the 2017 Nobel Prize through the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, the consortium of NGOs <laughs> leading the civil society campaign for the Ban Treaty. To its credit, in its statement upon receiving no notice of the Nobel Peace Prize, ICANN highlighted the role of earlier disarmament efforts and the essential leadership of A-bomb and nuclear testing survivors. Quote, this prize is a tribute to the tireless efforts of many millions of campaigners and concerned citizens worldwide who, ever since the dawn of the atomic age, have largely protested, have loudly protested nuclear weapons, insisting that they can serve no legitimate purpose and must be forever banished from the face of the earth. It is a tribute also to the survivors of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Hibaksha, and victims of nuclear test explosions around the world, whose searing testimonies and unstinting advocacy were instrumental in securing this landmark agreement. The Ban Treaty's unambiguous prohibition of the threat of use is an essential point for the peace movement and civil society in the nuclear armed and nuclear dependent states to highlight in our public education and advocacy the ideology of nuclear deterrence, threatened use of nuclear weapons, must be delegitimized and stigmatized to make progress on abolishing nuclear weapons, and our task is to change the discourse from the bottom up. In this time of multiple global crises, our work for the elimination of nuclear weapons must take place in a much broader framework, taking into account the interface between nuclear and conventional weapons and militarism in general, the humanitarian long-term environmental consequences of nuclear war, and the fundamental incompatibility of nuclear weapons with democracy, the rule of law, and human well-being. And just to sort of preview some thoughts for the Q&A session, um, in answer to what can be done, there are no shortcuts or magic bullets. The nuclear weapons ha haves and have-nots must talk to each other. For this to happen, we need to mobilize public opinion from the bottom up. We in the U.S. and the other nuclear armed states must also advocate for risk reduction measures hand in hand with disarmament. And one promising vehicle is marriage for peace, so ask me about that. Thank you very much. Is Mary Leah Kelly here? Yes, she is. There you are. Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, Mary Leah Kelly is the executive director of Tri Valley Citizens Against a Radioactive Environment, or Tri Valley Cares. It's based in Livermore, home of the Livermore National Laboratory, one of two labs where U.S. nuclear weapons are designed. The other is at Los Alamos, New Mexico. Tri Valley Cares monitors the weapons and their radiation. Since 1993, when Livermore residents founded the group, it has worked to prevent further development of nuclear weapons and seeks their abolition. Ms. Kelly has testified before the U.S. Armed Services Committee, the state legislature, and other bodies. Since 1989, she has served on the community work group to advise the Environmental Protection Agency, state agencies, and the communities of the Superfund cleanup of radioactive and other pollution at Livermore Lab. She edits the quarterly Tri-Valley Care Citizens Watch and has written for publications including the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. In 2001, she entered the Alameda County Women's Hall of Fame. Here is Mary Lee Kelly. Thank you. I'm not touching it again. Good afternoon, friends. And thank you to the Warren Law League for inviting me today. Um, I am going to focus on national and local policy and action in response to nuclear war. How can it be prevented? This is um, what uh, Jeanette and I talked about in particular. But I do want to begin with a couple of additional words about the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. On Tri-Valley Care's behalf, I was also at the United Nations during the process of negotiating the treaty. 
And I want to tell you that it was extraordinary. And I'm telling you this as someone who has also been to all of the non-proliferation treaty review conferences and a number of other venues at the UN. It was extraordinary in demonstrating the true meaning of that term we hear in the law all the time, which is good intention. What I saw were countries who, in one case, gave a statement, came back the next day, and said, I heard from other countries, I listened to their statements, and I would like to amend my country's statement. Imagine, they were all there with the focus and intention on negotiating and adopting the best treaty possible. And I believe that that led to the 122 states parties voting for and only one opposed. Yes. The other thing that I want to say I think is really unique about the treaty is that it is about changing norms. You know, the United States, as Jackie said, said we'll never accede to the treaty. The United States still has not signed the landmine treaty because it swore it wouldn't, but it changed international norms, the landmine treaty, and the United States now follows all of its uh, prohibitions to the letter. So I think there's a lot of hope as well as danger right now. And I do want to talk about some of the danger, however. <coughs> As you know, I'm sure, the United States and Russia have more than 90% of all nuclear weapons in the world. There are just slightly under 15,000 of them total. That is enough to end life as we know it on the planet. And I'm going to focus on US policy, US budget, and our both opportunities and responsibilities to make changes. So Tri-Valley Cares has done an analysis of the Trump nuclear posture review, which was released earlier this year in February. And we titled our analysis, Trump's New Warheads and a Willingness to Use Them. And there are copies on the back. And it's particularly useful because we have page citations to the nuclear posture review itself. It, as someone who critiqued Obama's nuclear posture review rather severely, I have to say that it actually turns the screw, changes things, and makes it worse. It increases the circumstance under which the United States may respond with a nuclear weapon, including to such things like cyber attack. Think about that for a moment. It also has brand new nuclear weapons as part of it. Jackie mentioned the submarine launch ballistic missile weapon. I want to focus on three others. I want to specifically, because that one is a little bit farther out in time. In fact, I've talked to folks at the Navy who off the record, so I won't name them, said actually we're kind of hoping there's another president and we never get to this. Um, that's, but I want to talk about a nearer term one, which is the low yield warhead for the submarine launched ballistic missile. Low yield, by definition, is intended to make a nuclear weapon more usable because it is more useful to nuclear war planners in more scenarios. That by itself is uniquely dangerous. It will also be on a submarine with other high yield nuclear weapons. If launched, the, the country against whom they're launched cannot tell the difference. Nor, frankly, do I think they would care. Oh, gee, we're only going to get nuked by a low-yield nuclear weapon. Um, That's a bad one. Not somebody I usually quote, 
But um, let me see if I can find the exact quote here. But, but Schultz, Char the uh, former George Schultz, uh, was asked to testify about this in front of Congress, and I will get you the exact quote. And he said, I love this, a nuclear weapon is a nuclear weapon. You use a small one, and then you go to a bigger one. I think nuclear weapons are nuclear weapons, and we need to draw the line there. One of my few chances to get to quote a Republican source. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can do to stop that particular nuclear weapon from ever becoming real. Hence, preventing nuclear war. I also want to point out Livermore Lab is developing a new warhead for a new long-range standoff weapon. This would be a new warhead for a new missile that the Pentagon is developing. This marks the first time since the end of the Cold War that the United States has developed a new warhead and a new delivery vehicle at the same time. This is intended for the pilot to be able to stand off, that hence its name, the target, and to launch a radar evading, terrain hugging, nuclear warhead to land on an unsuspecting population thousands of miles away. By definition, my friends, this is a first use nuclear weapon. And the third one I want to highlight for you today, and they're all in here along with more, is the interoperable warhead, which is a wholly new warhead Livermore is the lead lab to design it. In the Bush Posture Review, they call it the W-78 replacement. As a wholly new, this would be an ICBM launched warhead. As a wholly new weapon, it sets us on the slippery slope potentially to a resumption of nuclear explosive testing in Nevada. Obama had put it on a five-year hold at least, Trump took it off the five-year hold early and put money for it in his fiscal year 2019 budget request. There's also a lot in our analysis about the beefing up of the infrastructure within the U.S. nuclear weapons complex to make new plutonium pits, new uranium secondaries, and to actually produce these new warheads that Livermore and Los Alamos are developing. But in the interest of time, I'm going to move quickly to the money. You know the expression, follow the money. If that's true in other things, it is doubly, triply true with respect to nuclear weapons. I sometimes explain that in a country that already has plutonium and highly enriched uranium and all the materials needed for a nuclear weapon, there are only two things that that country needs. Money and people, and money buys the people. So if you want to stop nuclear weapons in the US as part of preventing nuclear war, then it is imperative that we prevent Congress from providing the money necessary to develop these nuclear weapons. So to give you the White House perspective, and I want to um, back up one step. Um, you heard from Jackie that, um, that the 30-year figure under Obama for U.S. new nuclear weapons delivery systems and infrastructure in the weapons complex was a billion and that it's higher under Trump. If you simply put in a modest rate of inflation and you look at these new weapons, it is in the neighborhood of $2 trillion. It's hard to even comprehend what $2 trillion is. But think of it as a theft from the young, from the elderly, from health care, from schools, from, to quote Dr. Martin Luther King, from programs of social uplift. Instead, it's going for programs to end civilization and all life as we know it. 
So President Trump blithely said on the exact day that his um, fiscal year 2019 budget request was being delivered to Congress, quote, we're increasing arsenals of virtually every weapon. We will have a nuclear force that will be absolutely modernized and brand new. In the face of that, what are some suggestions? What can we do? The top line budget for the National Nuclear Security Administration, and this is the part of the government that creates the warheads and bombs and runs the nuclear weapons complex, their top line is going up. Uh, to $13 billion. And relatively small money, when you're talking about nuclear weapons, um, is required to begin that process of designing the nuclear weapon. Until you get to the point of bending metal farther in the development, it's a small amount of money. And of course, the really big money is the submarines and the bombers to deliver them. But I think of this money as the tip of the spear. And I will tell you from my 35 years of doing this work with Tri-Valley Cares back since 1983, one thing I've learned is that a program is easier to stop the earlier you get in to stop it, before it has wind at its back, before it has people's careers who are dependent upon it. And so with that in mind, I want to tell you what is in the fiscal 2019 budget. It was just passed this month by the House and Senate, signed by the President a week ago this past Friday. So this is hot off the press. The interoperable warhead has 53 million that is that W78 replacement to jumpstart it, the Trump administration nuclear posture review, to jumpstart it ahead of the Obama freeze. However, and never think it's impossible to get something done just because all three branches of, you know, the Senate, the House, the President, uh, look like they're on a complete war trajectory some days, most days. Um, we actually got language in there to force a study of the cost and risk, technical risk, of doing a new warhead for the W-78 versus just doing a refurbishment. So this is going to be very important to make sure that it's truly impartial and that it looks at everything, but next year I may be able to come and tell you that based on the results of this, Congress is no longer willing to fund this new weapon. So stay tuned. I also want to tell you something about the W76-2, and I promise you don't have to memorize all these numbers. But the W76-2 is what this low yield submarine launched warhead is called. And very recently, Ted Lieu, along with Adam Smith, who's the ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee, Ted Lieu's from Southern California, introduced HR 6840, and I put some at the back, and if they're all gone when you leave, just go to thomas.gov. And 6840 is called the Hold the Line Act, L-Y-N-E, meaning Hold the Low Yield Nuclear Explosive Act. My small part in this, which I'll share, is I met with Ted Liu in the spring, and well, there were a group of five of us, and he challenged us to come up with a snappy name for this bill and he picked my name. <laughs> so, the Hold the Line Act. And 
I'll just read a couple paragraphs, but it says a new low yield nuclear weapon to be carried on a ballistic missile submarine risks lowering the threshold for nuclear use and increasing the chance of miscalculation that could escalate into all out nuclear exchange. When launched, such a low yield nuclear warhead would be indistinguishable to an adversary, well, as I said this, from the high yield W-76 and W-88 submarine launched warheads. And it goes through a couple other reasons right in the act about why this is a bad idea. And then it says, notwithstanding any other provision of law, none, none of the funds authorized to be appropriated or otherwise made available for fiscal year 2019 or any fiscal year thereafter for the Department of Defense or the Department of Energy which is the NNSA that I was talking about, may be obligated or expended for the research and development, production, or deployment of the Trident D5 low-yield nuclear warhead. Right. No money. So Ted Liu is about to send out a dear colleague. I expect that to happen on Monday. A dear colleague is a letter saying, please come and co-sponsor the bill. That's what it means. And I want to tell you that there are already one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten co-sponsors. And the three of them are from Northern California. So if your representative is John Garamende, Barbara Lee, or Jimmy Panetta, please do me a favor. Call them and thank them for signing, for co-sponsoring the Hold the Line Act. For one thing, they very rarely get thank yous. They remember it. For another thing, you're telling them that their constituency cares about nuclear weapons and that helps them sign on to the next bill and it helps them work this bill more vigorously. So just because Barbara Lee is your rep and she's on it, please still call her. If I did not name your representative, and there are a bunch of them here in the Bay Area who are likely sign-ons if it is brought to their attention, please on Monday, right away, call their office. If you know somebody in the district office, call that person, or call the Washington, D.C. office and ask to speak to the defense aid. This will actually be one concrete way we can prevent nuclear war here from the Bay Area. I want to conclude by saying just a few words about the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory of which you've heard. You've heard that it is one of two places that designs and develops every nuclear weapon in the U.S. arsenal. There are opportunities for you to stop nuclear war by impacting what happens at Livermore Lab. Think globally, act locally. This, and I have pie charts on the back there for you, this pie chart is the fiscal year 19 budget for Livermore Lab. That big blue area that looks like it's eating everything else, that's a budget line called nuclear weapons activities. The budget line called science is a teeny little sliver of 2% of the budget. So stopping nuclear weapons at Livermore Lab is one concrete way to stop nuclear war. With these new warheads that Livermore is the lead lab to design, Livermore has come up with a harebrained scheme to detonate high yields of explosives in the open air near Tracy. Now Livermore, the main site, many of you have come out on Hiroshima Day or Nagasaki Day and I invite you next year. That's called the main site. The lab also operates something called the Site 300 High Explosive Testing Range and it's within 7,000 feet of the city of Tracy which now has about 90,000 people. 
5,500 new homes are going to be built right up to the boundary. And this is where they decided it would be a good idea. This is the Trump administration with money on the table and no adult supervision in the room. That this would be a good idea to go do bomb blasts with 121 toxic materials according to the lab, not according to Tri-Valley Carriage. If you read their documents, 121 toxic materials in these blasts. Right now, they can do 100 pounds a day high explosive weight in these blasts. They want to increase it to 1,000 pounds a day. It's a tenfold increase. This is back to what they were doing in the early days when one of our members had his window shattered by these blasts. They're trying to go back to those early days of the Cold War with this. And they would be able to do a total of 7,500 pounds of high explosives in the course of a year. So I invite you to read more about it. What I'm holding up is a petition in English on one side and Spanish on the other side, because Tracy is 40% Latino. And do you know how many words Livermore Lab has translated into Spanish in the history of Zero. the site? Zero. 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 So we are doing what we can, and we put it in English and Spanish. I invite you to sign it or take it home and read it and then mail it to us. Take an extra copy for your friends. This is how we are going to stop this proposal just as we are planning to stop these new nuclear weapons, and that is people power, public outcry, letting them know that people are paying attention and watching, and then we will back that with the technical and legal analysis needed. Thank you. Teacher and I said, uh, "How do you 
get them to be so nice to each other. And she looked at me and she says, Mr. McGovern, come here. So I went into this room and there was a table. And uh, there were five chairs around the table. And so I sat down on one of the chairs and she said, now, how many toys do you see on that table? I said, three. That's how we do it, Mr. McGovern. We teach them that they have to share. Okay. Now that sounds so pedestrian, doesn't it? But after World War II, uh, our friend George Kennan wrote a famous policy paper, which was the first policy paper of the uh, council that he headed up, 1948. And he said, the United States controls 50% of the world's resources, but only has 6.3% of the world's people. Mm -hmm. Ergo, therefore, we have to do everything we can to maintain this disproportionality. We, don't, we can't be sidetracked, Kenan said, by soft things like civil rights or uh, people's welfare, it will come to the exercise of hard power. George Kennan, George Kennan, I mean, he was, <laughs> before he was my, my idol there as uh, the expert on, on Russia. So that was the mentality, and we could do that right after World War II because we were the only ones that really escaped the havoc and the destruction. Now, gradually, that's sort of going back to a more normal situation. And uh, Kennan is uh, no longer right in terms of what we have dominion over. We don't control 50% of the world's natural resources, and, and uh, we don't even have 6.3% of the world's population anymore. But the mentality is exactly the same. In other words, these kids, these people never went to the nursery school that my my grandson went to, where he was he was taught that you have to share things, right? So, where does it leave us? Well, um, it leaves us with the archaic, no longer valid notion that we are the sole indispensable country in the world, right? Okay, well. We all, how many times have we heard that? You know, Obama was before America first. So what does that mean? Well, when I talk in colleges, I sort of try to test these people. I say, well, do you know what a synonym is? Synonym. synonym. And I say, oh yeah, it's a, uh, it's a like word. I say, yeah, well, how about an antonym? And now, usually one or two would say, oh, that's an opposite word. I say, good, good, good. So what's the opposite? of indispensable. Uh, well, it you know, takes some of five seconds. They dispensable? I said, yeah. So you're another country in the world. Uh, you are regarded as dispensable. Uh, you know, it's really pretty arrogant. And the countries are looking at us now. It goes in spades with Trump in power. Um, when Relations were good between Obama and Putin. After Putin pulled his chestnuts, had pulled Obama's chestnuts out of the fire in Syria, and told, uh, and told Obama, you don't have to attack Syria. We can get those weapons, those chemical weapons destroyed. And they did. Okay. Well, that was the, the heyday of, uh, of relations between our two countries at that, uh, at that particular point in time. And um, Putin wrote an article in the New York Times, an op-ed in the New York Times, on September 11, coincidence, September 11, 2013. And he talked about how much he was enjoying the, uh, the reality that an atmosphere of trust, as he put it, had grown up between Mr. Obama and Mr. Putin, not only on a statesman-like level, but on a personal level. Whoa, so September 11th, 2013. Well, fast forward about six months and you've got the coup in Kiev, 
where um, people who didn't want a good relationship with Russia mounted a coup on Russia's doorstep. And we know that that was the most blatant coup in history, partly because it appeared, it was forecast on YouTube two weeks before. It's the only time I know of that a coup in any major country was put on YouTube two weeks before. How many of you know about this conversation that was uh, that was intercepted? Well, it was a uh, it was uh, Victoria Nuland, who was the Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, and the uh, Jeffrey Pyatt, the uh, ambassador we had in the Ukraine. And uh, Nuland said, "Well, we got this glued now. Uh, Yats is the guy, uh, and the other fellows they can Klitschko, and the other well, just wait in the wings." So Yats is the guy. So I look at YouTube, listen to him, and I feel sorry for Yats. Yats Senior, of course, the guy's name. Okay, I'm saying, wow, poor guy. You know, he was all set to be head of the new Ukrainian government, and now, of course, you know, a decent respect for the opinions of mankind would prevent him from becoming <coughs> the new prime minister. But no, no. 22nd of, I wake up on the 23rd of February, and uh, the Yats, Yatsinyuk is the new Prime Minister of Ukraine. He's talking about joining NATO. He's talking about banning Russia as an official language. And he's talking about, you know, just the go to ahead and seizing Crimea and everything else. So uh, my initial reaction was, you know, we'll write an article, McGovern. This is the most strange, this is the strangest set of circumstances you've ever seen. So I did one, I, it was titled, Yikes! It's Yats! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, these, these things are really strange. So, so maybe we could just dispense with this uh, uh, city on the hill, uh, America first uh, notion because it no longer is true. Um, what the various US administrations have done is frittered away our preeminent place in the world China and Russia have a virtual alliance now. <laughs> when I was a young analyst at CIA, I, I made my bread and butter by uh, explaining how much they hated each other, the Chinese and the Russians, and they did, you know. I had never expected them to be coming together as they are now. Uh, that's a big, big thing, because it mark my words, if there's trouble between the US and Russian forces in Ukraine or Syria, there's going to be trouble in the South China Sea as well. That's how tight that alliance is. And I don't know if even someone like Mad Dog Mattis wants to look at this, the specter of a two-front war between two major, major powers. Uh, I don't know what it'll do if uh, Trump proceeds anyway. Uh, Marines are very very good about saluting smartly and doing what they're told. So that gives me gives me a lot of pause. So I want to uh, advertise the best book that I know on doomsday, on what we have been incredibly fortunate in avoiding up until now. And there's no reason to believe that our luck will hold out given the people who are in power on this side of the Atlantic. It's The Doomsday Machine by Daniel Ellsberg. Yeah. How many have read it? Oh, wow, okay, this is a good audience. Okay. It is incredible. It is very, very good. It has all kinds of vignettes. Uh, Dan, of course, was a war planner way back when. And uh, so he describes what that was like. You know, these uh, Air Force generals would say, well, we'll probably kill about 50 million Russians and that, 30 million Chinese. And, I mean, why the Chinese? Well, not just because they're communists too. And uh, we have, that's the plan. We don't want to have to re 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 you know, refashion the plan. So it was really, really stupid, and, and Dan explains all that. Now I want to read one vignette. How many of you like Kurt Vonnegut? Yeah. Okay, he's one of my favorite authors, okay? Well, he appears in Dan's book, 
because he was a POW in Dresden when the firebombing took place. They gave the POWs a shelter underneath a butcher factory, but every, every morning they had to do an unseemly task, and I'll, I'll explain that to you here. The RAF attacked Dresden with magnesium bombs the night of Ash Wednesday, February 13, 1945. U.S. bombers attacked with explosives and incendiaries in the daylight the next morning, Valentine's Day and the day after, but used blind bombing through the smoke and thick clouds. Kirk Vonnegut went through this experience. He was in prison, he was a POW, and they kept those people safe at night. But in the morning, and I'm reading from Dan's book, he came up in the morning to empty out shelters filled with dead people shrunk to the size of a large gingerbread cookie. They call them Bombenbrandschrumpfleichen. Okay, Leichen is corpse. Schrumpf is to shrink. Okay, Bombenbrand is incendiary bombs. So think about that, guys. Think about that. People the size of a cookie. Now, Vonnegut survived all that. And you know, he had an interesting take on things. He was, as most of you know, a, uh, an atheist or naturalist, or what do they call him, a humanist. Uh, but when somebody said that, you know, Kurt, you know, what, do you think of, what do you think of Jesus of Nazareth? He said, uh, well, uh, you know, I, I don't know if he was God's son or not. Um, but if it weren't for the Sermon on the Mount, I think I'd just as soon be a cockroach. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. So even for maybe Kirk's wartime experience um, uh, address that. Now I'd like to just show, uh, because I've had some wonderful help here, uh, a couple of clips from, uh, well, one is uh, from uh, Vladimir Putin and our former ambassador uh, to, to Russia and the Soviet Union, Jack Matlock, who happens to be a good friend of mine. And then and the next one will be uh, Putin expressing, well, he loses it. Uh, uh, let me not ruin it for you. Okay. <laughs> Я был лично против этого выхода. Я понимаю, о чем вы говорите. Я бы сказал, что я не думаю, что какие-то дальнейшие планы по размещению такого оружия могли бы угрожать российской системе. Но в целом я не поддерживаю системы ПРО и основной источник этого это не угрожать России это чтобы были рабочие места в США ведь это военно-промышленный комплекс и сколько людей там работает господин посол я считаю ваши аргументы неубедительными отношусь к огромному уважению к вашему опыту и к искусству которому которым вы пользуетесь, дипломатическому искусству, которым вы пользуетесь безупречно, уклоняясь от прямого ответа. Вы все-таки на него дали прямой ответ, но, но элементы украшательства в вашем ответе были. Не нужно создавать рабочие места, которые результатом своей деятельности имеют угрозу для всего человечества. А потом создание новых систем, систем, против, систем противоракетной борьбы, это новые рабочие места. Зачем их создавать в такой сфере? Давайте их будем создавать в сфере биологии, в сфере фармацевтики, в сфере высоких технологий, не связанных с производством вооружений. Теперь, что касается, угрожает это Россия или не угрожает, уверяю вас. Американские специалисты в области безопасности и 
стратегических вооружений прекрасно отдают себе отчет в том, что это угрожает российскому ядерному потенциалу. И вся эта система создается для того, чтобы свести ядерные потенциалы других ядерных государств, кроме США, к нулю. I feel a little awkward here because Jack Matlock was an excellent ambassador to the last stage of the Soviet Union, the first stage of Russia, the new Russia, and he's extremely, extremely bright. I don't know what possessed him to say the real truth there in talking about a jobs program, but you can see that Putin jumped all over the possibility to indicate that they may think, that is, the United States may think that it's a jobs program. The Russians have to take it more seriously. Now, what Putin uh, and what the Russians and, and others, the Chinese and, and the North Koreans and the South Koreans and everybody else take, should take seriously, is how dangerous this is, how destabilizing it is, okay? And the Russians can't pretend anymore that this ABM system, or this missile defense system, is against Iran because Iran's uh, hands are tied for another decade. So I'd like you to pay very, very good attention to this next clip, which just is about a minute long. And it shows Putin very uncharacteristically losing his cool. He's talking to Western journalists. They don't get it, okay? They have no idea how the Russians look at this as a threat to their national security, as a threat to their retaliatory capability if these missile defense systems are able to squelch their offensive capability with their ICBM. So watch, watch this next uh, thing, and, and you'll see from this segment, which I hope will go on just a few seconds now, how Putin really is kind of beside himself, because as you can see, some of these Western journalists say, oh, well, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. So let's have that second uh, second. Clip. It's only one minute, so don't fall asleep. System of Pro продолжает строиться. Значит, мы были правы, когда говорили, что нас обманывают. С нами не искренне, ссылаясь на якобы имеющуюся иранскую ядерную угрозу при строительстве системы ТРОС. Ну так оно и есть, на самом деле. В очередной раз пытались нас надуть. Сейчас построили эту систему. Сейчас ставят там ракеты. Так? Но вам должно быть известно, что ракеты эти закладываются в капсулу, которая используется для пусков э, ракет средней дальности Томагавк морского базирования. Туда закладывают сейчас антиракеты, способные поражать цели на расстоянии 500 километров. Но мы знаем, технологии развиваются. Мы примерно знаем, в каком году примерно американцы получат новую ракету, которая будет уже не 500 километров, а 1000, а потом больше. И с этого момента они начнут нашему ядерному потенциалу. Мы, мы по годам знаем, что будет происходить. И они знают, что мы знаем. Это вам только вешают лапшу на уши, как у нас говорят. А вы, в свою очередь, вешаете своему населению. И люди не чувствуют опасности. Вот меня что беспокоит. Ну, как, вот, как мы не можем понять? Мы, мы тащим мир вообще в, в совершенно новое измерение. Вот в чем проблема. Делают вид, что как будто ничего не происходит. Но я не знаю даже, как достучать. So there you have it, you know. What's the matter with you folks? Why can't you understand this? And he's talking to the journalists, of course, and you can't see any rational discussion of this in Western media. The Russians are very upset about this, and by extension, you can see that applying to the Far East itself. So with respect to the new president that we have, President Trump, I would have to say that he has huge openings here. Um, Obama promised after he was re-elected he'd deal. Now it's Trump's turn, and this will be topic A on Russia's agenda. There's no reason why we can't get around the table as we did in 72 and subsequently and deal on this very key strategic issue. And I hope that obtains with respect to the Far East as well. Thanks very much for listening. The, the Russian leaders this has all happened before, and it's all been very dangerous. And I compliment people who went before me to talk about the military, industrial, congressional, intelligence, media, 
complex. Yeah, that's the new element. The media is completely on their side. So we're up against it. And uh, Dan Ellsberg uh, wrote this incredible book. Uh, he said in the book, or he said, whether humans can eliminate the danger of near-term extinction by nukes remains to be seen. I choose to act as if that is still possible. Well, we've been lucky. We've been incredibly lucky. And if you read this doomsday machine, you will see how close we have come to incinerating the planet. There are lots of things that appear in this that nobody knows. Dan knows. There are even a couple things Dan doesn't know, but I know, because okay, I worked within, okay? So this is really, really labile, as, as the Germans say. It's very, very delicate, and we could all be extinguished. Um, now, what could do it? Well, if you build up a propaganda, if you build up a, a masterful propaganda campaign, as we have done here, uh, blackening Putin, making him the, the equivalent of the devil, uh, well, uh, it can become very, very dangerous. Now, let me just go back uh, to some uh, sometimes when I know exactly how dangerous this was. On September 1st, 1983, KAL-007, a Korean airliner, was shot down by a Russian pilot. That was big. 289, I think. A lot of people died. Now, did they do it? Of course they did it. Was the plane off course? Well, hello. <laughs> it was way off course. As a matter of fact, it was flying a flight track, very much like the RC-135s, the intelligence collection uh, uh, planes that that we had going over Russia and nearby. So did they think it was a spy plane? Well, we know that they thought it was a spy plane, okay? Now, when this kind of thing happens, it's a golden opportunity for the propagandists to say, aha, now we can blacken the Russians in a new way and make sure that we somehow remain in charge, okay? so. The Soviet fighter pilot did believe he was pursuing a U.S. spy plane. It was dark. He had trouble identifying the plane. At the instructions of Soviet ground controllers, the pilot had circled the KAL airliner and tilted his wings to force the aircraft down. The pilot said he fired warning shots too. Now, what happened? Well, the fellow who was in charge of State Department propaganda, a fellow named Alvin A. Snyder, wrote a book. And he called the book Warriors of Disinformation. Okay. And he recounts that Charlie Wick, who was in charge of that part of State Department, it was called USIA at the time, ordered Snyder to uh, look at the intercepted tape and uh, make sure he, trans he, he got it transcribed. And, um, and Alvin did his job and they showed it at the UN, just like at least Stevenson did with the UN, with the YouTube uh, photos. So what happened? Well, actually, they didn't give poor Alvin the whole tape. Tape was 40 minutes, I think. They gave him eight minutes and 32 seconds. The tape showed, in quotes, that the Russians did this deliberately, knowing that it was a civilian aircraft. Okay, it's wrong. They didn't. You can see from the, so the Soviet intercepts that they immediately recognized this was a horrible mistake that they tried to tried to explain but it was too late, the plane was killed. So, what am I saying here? I'm saying that when 
the tape here, I see it runs to 50 minutes, and Snyder said he was, uh, he, the tape segment that USA ran only eight minutes and 32 seconds. <laughs> he uh, had a little comment in his book, he said, do I, do I detect the fine hand of Richard Nixon's secretary, Rosemary Woods here? <laughs> Some of you are old enough to remember that. Okay. So, um, what do we have here? Well, we have Snyder writing a book 10 years later when he knows what the real story is. And uh, he drew a really remarkable lesson from the incident. And what he said was this. The moral of the story is that all governments including our own, lie when it suits their purposes. The key is to lie first." End quote. So, have there been a lot of lies? They sure as hell have. How about MH17? John Kerry gets up and he says, we have the trajectory information, we, have, we know when the plane was shot down, we know where it was shot down, you know, we, but he never gave any of that information to any of the inspection teams. John Kerry has the dubious distinction of being the only Secretary of State that I'm aware of, U.S. Secretary of State, that the head of Russia, Vladimir Putin, said, "On vriot, on znayet što vriot, et pichalne." And he know Russian. No, no Russian. He's lying. He knows that he's lying. It's really sad. And he said that the very day that President Obama arrived in Leningrad for a big meeting. So you gotta, you gotta recognize this because as you know with Russiagate and all that kind of stuff, uh, you've, got, uh, you've got real problems if, you don't, uh, if you're not really perspicacious about what you take from the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal as truth. Now, let me just tell you that September 1st, 1983, 1983 was about as close as we came uh, to destroying the planet. Now, Reagan had said the Russians are an uh, evil empire. The KGB, we know from our sources, the KGB was told to uh, really hasten their efforts to find out what we were planning because they feared the worst, okay? And, uh, <coughs> and there, was a, uh, there was an exercise planned for November. The exercise was called Abel Archer. And it was an incredible exercise because it involved the vice president and the president. It was really, really realistic, right? That's not what you want to do, folks, when you're ginning up this anti-Soviet propaganda and you're giving the Russians to believe that, whoa, maybe this is the real thing. Now, colleagues of mine at, at the CIA, first and foremost, Mel Goodman, who used to work for me, is a really good guy, okay? He was so incensed at the things we were picking up that the Russians were taking this as serious preparations for war, for an attack, okay? They went up to Bobby Gates, who was another guy who worked for me. Uh, you know him as Robert Gates, uh, later. Uh, yeah. So uh, Gates was head of analysis. He would, we got to tell the White House, knock it off, it's terrible. And Gates said, oh, no, 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 they're not really. So he went directly to Bill Casey. Now, I don't hold any brief for Bill Casey, but he did this thing right. He was persuaded by Mel Goodman, the only time he was persuaded by Mel Goodman. He went down to the White House Situation Room and said, knock it off, knock it off. They're taking this as real preparations for war, okay? Wow, okay. So that's how, how close we came in 1983. At the end of 1983, you had the KAL thing, you had the KGB wondering what we were about to do, you had the evil empire, and then you have uh, what I just discussed, the Abel Archer, very realistic exercise. So, um, these are two of the times we came very close to incinerating the world. Uh, there's, uh, the, who knows who, Vasily Alexandrovich, 
Vasily Alexandrovich Archipov is. Ah, good, good. Who was he? Yeah, he was a submariner, okay? And he was off Cuba. And they had been out of radio, 80 radio contact with Moscow for about a week. They didn't know what was going on. And uh, they concluded that you know, it was all over. They might as well get rid of their nuclear torpedoes. <laughs> and there were three people on this U-boat. Two of them were military, and Archipov was the uh, politruk, the uh, um, the party member who also had to sign off on this. And when they wanted him to, you know, turn the thing, he said, "No, we don't have any instructions from Moscow." Whoa! <laughs> now they proceeded to surface. Nothing happened, but that was as close. That was really close. During Cuba, uh, it could have come out very, very differently. So these are the kinds of things that we have to be aware of. And uh, once we tell our, our co-citizens how labile, how, how delicate these things are, I think that, uh, that we'll have uh, achieved our purpose. Now, I want to close with sort of observing of some of my, my, uh, uh, my heroes or heroines. Uh, you all know Medea Benjamin, so I don't have to mention Medea. She's at the top of the, she's at the, top of the list. Um, but you know, Rosa Parks is also someone who, when you look at it closely, um, here's Rosa Parks. She went and she studied at the Highlander School, right? And she learned all kinds of things to do and how to do nonviolent resistance and everything else. And, and um, after she did her thing, Eleanor Roosevelt appears at the Highlander School. And she go, goes up to the headmaster and she said, did you tell, did you tell uh, Miss Parks that she'd be called a communist, that she'd be, uh, she'd be denigrated, that she'd be marginalized? Did you tell her that? <laughs> Headmaster said, no, we didn't tell. Well, why did you not? She says, because Rosa Parks was the last person we thought would do that kind of thing. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, now, some of you may be the last person that you think uh, would do that kind of thing. Uh, please realize that we can do these kinds of things and that it's high time that we bite the bullet and do them. I've said this before. Um, People who have this color hair, you know, we have a big advantage. Uh, I learned that when I turned my back on Hillary Clinton and was beaten up and, uh, and dragged out, my Veterans for Peace friends, uh, they got right on the email and, you know, she got thousands of emails and telephone calls. Why? Because Americans don't like old people to get beat up. Okay. Right. Young people, ah, they gotta come to them. Yeah, you know, why am I doing young? Oh, young people, okay. but old people, they don't like them. They get beat up. So, please be aware that you have this distinct advantage, and you ought to put it into play. They're not gonna kill you. They're not even gonna dislocate your shoulder if you have somebody from Code Pink filming it. <laughs> so, you know, realize that because. Rosa Parks famously said, the more we give in, the more we comply with the kind of treatment that we're given, the more oppressive it becomes. So, um, as some of you know, Dan Berrigan is one of, my, one of my heroes. He said a lot of things, and wrote a lot of things, but uh, briefly, the briefest one, he said, you know, the difference between doing nothing and doing something is everything. Got it? The difference between doing nothing and doing something is everything. Now, I was at Columbia School of Journalism two years ago. We were watching a film about drones and what they're doing to those poor people in Afghanistan, Pakistan, elsewhere. And uh, 
Somebody said, oh, you know, um, they couldn't possibly fly without the mechanism there, the steering mechanism that Lockheed, uh, Lockheed makes. And I'm sorry, not Lockheed, but Westinghouse. And Westinghouse, you know, their CEO lives in, in Morristown, New Jersey, about, a, about, a, about an hour from here. Now, I grew up in the 50s and 60s, right? So I kept looking. In the 50s and 60s, there would be 30 or 40 people going to the back of the room, hiring a bus to go down to, to Morristown, New Jersey, and confront the guy who's making the, the, the gizmos that make it so possible to kill people. And so I, I remarked, I said, well, well, you guys, so you know where he lives? And you're just gonna say, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> So the times are different. But you know, those of us who've been around a while, and those of us who have a certain, uh, what we say, uh, respect from, from people, and uh, people, young people have to look up to us because we're the only act in town. And so if we do these things, then there's a chance that young people will realize, that, hey, there's a lot at stake here. Look at these crazy older people putting their bodies into it. So let's do that, folks, because the time is wasting, and uh, we need to get on it. And uh, I thank you for letting me come before you and to appear after these wonderful women who talked before me. And I'd be happy to uh, handle Q&As and so forth. Thank you. What should be our first step towards, um, and I would like to make a stab at it, how do we raise consciousness about it? Because we need a groundswell beneath us and not just people going to the baseball game. Not that I want to knock it, but you know, we have a lot going on in our worlds right now. In any public space, you will see somebody with their face buried in their phone. So how can we wake people up? And what is, you know, what is Well, I'm glad that you started us there because I think the uh, most important answer to that question is getting information out to people. People cannot object to something they don't know is happening. And there are a variety of ways um, I'm going to leave it to your creativity and, and predilection, which ones you choose. But there is no wrong way to get information out. First you research it, make sure that what you're saying is accurate. And whether you choose to talk to your friends and neighbors, write a letter to the editor, write an article for a newsletter for an organization you're with, create a children's story out of it. There's no wrong answer. Um, we need to begin to discuss these things around the tables again. And that's the first thing. Second, I will repeat something I said, which is in the United States, these weapons, and we are talking specifically about low yield weapons, although frankly a submarine launched low yield nuclear warhead, I wouldn't call it, battlefield in the sense of the 1970s when NATO had the you know backpack bombs. That's, that was a different thing. But low yield is low yield. And to help people understand that that means it's a more usable nuclear weapon and that it's dis all nuclear weapons are wrong, but it's distinctly destabilizing and dangerous. And then in order to stop it, you have to stop the money. That low yield submarine launch nuclear weapon is not yet designed. You have it in your power to stop it from ever being designed. Some of you remember in the Bush administration, the robust nuclear earth penetrating bomb. It was never developed because we stopped it. They came back with something called the reliable replacement warhead. It was never developed because we stopped it. We have, within our power, the ability to stop the low yield submarine launch nuclear warhead before it is designed. And that's what I want to engage you in and I really want you to please take 
the uh, legislation, the hold the line legislation, and make sure that it gets lots of co-sponsors and passes. I'd like to add something to that because while I totally support that, I think it is not adequate to the situation we face. Now, I know you know that, but I want to say this because I have, first of all, all of the actively deployed nuclear weapons have a select, or most of them have a selectable yield already, which means that they can be dialed down to a very low yield. Second of all, low yield means Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And in 1999, when um, General Butler said that 20 nuclear weapons could destroy, you know, 25% um, of the uh, Soviet, po the Russian population, he was talking about 1999 weapons. So I think that we have to be a little bit more nuanced in our thinking about why is a new nuclear weapon worse than an existing nuclear weapon? Because it is true that these new weapons could be used in ways that could be very provocative and destabilizing, and I don't want to take away from that at all. But this legislation also says somewhere in it, we should be focusing on our strategic deterrent. So it's also reinforcing the US commitment to its strategic deterrent, that means the big bombs. And so we need to get beyond this. We need to stop this weapon, but we need to be developing language and getting language into legislation that talks about steps towards the abolition of nuclear weapons. The ban treaty does not, will not destroy a single nuclear weapon. Okay, because it's countries that don't have them. And defeating this horrible, dangerous, weapon will also not fundamentally change the, this very dangerous equation, particularly in this very unstable world. So I just want to challenge us a little bit to always be thinking about, okay, in Congress right now, that's how they calculate, they can you know, couch their language, but that's not good enough for us, so we have to push farther than that and really take on the whole enchilada. I have a question here that is directed to Ray himself. Could you comment on the Iran-Israel matter, which seems to be bubbling over every time we look at it, so. Couldn't hear. The Iran-Israel matter. Israel is, uh, Netanyahu is once again drawing pictures on paper and waving them around and making claims, and he accused a carpet factory of manufacturing and storing nuclear weapons, and you know, I don't know, I mean, Aladdin was so 90s that I don't even want to go there. But anyway, <laughs> let's, you know. Well, Netanyahu's uh, slideshow, was it back in April, I think it was, uh, was bogus. We knew all that stuff, and it had been totally discredited. Uh, you know, this business about the Iranians. Uh, well, who, who started that? those rumors? Well, actually, it was the Mossad, uh, the, uh, the Israeli um, intelligence service. Now, this is hard to explain to Americans because they're so suffused in propaganda. But the reality is that if someone asks me about why are we in Syria? Why have we been promoting uh, moderate rebels, so to speak? Obama himself said there's no such thing as a moderate rebel, right? Why are we doing that? And the answer is very simple, Israel and Saudi Arabia. Now, it used to be 80% Israel, now it's about 65% Israel, 35% Saudi Arabia. But we're doing their bidding, okay? Now, if Americans learn that, if Americans understand that, uh, and you know, it's not hard to understand. There was one very juicy report. If you can search the New York Times for September 6th, 2013, uh, there's a report by Jody Ruderin, who was kind of the new um, Washington, uh, Washington, sorry, New York Times reporter in, uh, in in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, actually. So she went to uh, the highest officials she could get access to, and when you're the New York Times, you get pretty much access. 
Uh, she said, no, um, tell me, what, what is your preferred outcome uh, in Syria? And they included Alon Pincus, who a very high diplomat, was a consul general in New York. And he said, Jody, this doesn't sound very nice, but our preferred outcome is no outcome. She says, it's hard to be say, no outcome? Yeah, uh, he explained, you know, as long as, uh, well, we look at it as kind of a, a playoff game where we don't want either side to win and we don't want either side to lose. As long as the blood flows, as long as it hemorrhages, as long as Sunni and Shia are at each other's throats in Syria and in the whole region, quote, Israel has nothing to fear from Syria, period, end quote. Now, you may ask how that got as the main story on the New York Times on September 6, 2013, and for that you'd have to know the, uh, uh, the upper crust uh, of the New York Times. On uh, Labor Day and the week after, they go out for martinis uh, in, in the Hamptons, you see, and uh, apparently uh, they took their censors with them, so Jody's article got on our, the lead article there. It hasn't been retracted. It's still there. Nobody knows about it. But it, it, in my view, it, it contains the answer. You know, uh, it contains the answer as to why we're in Syria and by by definition why we're in Iran. Well, why we threaten Iran too? Just two things on Iran. You hear that Iran is the primary. Uh, supporter of international terrorism. Well, that was true, like four decades ago, right? Five decades ago, no longer true. Okay. Who is Saudi Arabia? Are we were in the running for that too, and, and Israel. So uh, that's out and out false. And the other thing that Iran is working on a nuclear weapon, well, we thought we had laid that to rest with the National Intelligence Estimate in 2007, which said that they had stopped the nuclear weapons part of their program in, at the end of 2003 and had not resumed work. So, you know, the Israelis can do all these sideshows and get uh, a lot of uh, play in the New York Times, Washington Post, but they're lying through their teeth and this is, you know, the archetypical example of what George Washington warned about, you know, the, uh, the attachment of one country to another, the passionate attachment, and uh, where the, the uh, perceived names appear identical, but they're really not. And of course, in those days, Washington was afraid of getting into a war in support of France, but it goes, you know, it goes with space, it just make good common sense not to be passionately attached to another country whose aims, in this case, are very divergent from ours, at least in my view. Thank you. Okay, well, um, this question it refers to some mention that um, Jackie made in her speech to the Mayors for Peace. And could you please expand on explaining this very important movement that um, is the basis for other current um, back from the brink um, efforts moving cities and California um, to support the treaty, to support the, you know, the yeah. UN treaty. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, one of the hats I wear is, is I'm the North American Coordinator of Mayors for Peace, which means that I actually work for the city of Hiroshima for the mayor's office. And Mayor's for Peace was started in 1982 at the close of that se second special session on disarmament, founded by the mayors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, focused on supporting the elimination of nuclear weapons. Um, it grew to about 500 cities and kind of stagnated through the 90s. And then in 2003, the mayor of Hiroshima, Mayor Akiba, who some of you probably met at some point, uh, launched the 2020 Vision Campaign for the Global Elimination of Nuclear Weapons by the year 2020. And since then, membership has grown by more than tenfold. There are now 7,650 member cities in 163 countries. 
Now, one thing I want to note is that uh, the fastest growing membership is in Iran, where we have 1,009 members. The US, we have 215. Um, most of the cities, most of the mayors who are active around the world, and some of them are very active, are in cities that have experienced the scourge of war. The German mayors are very active. Well, why is that? <laughs> because the German cities were bombed out. So that's another problem we have here with recruiting and activating our members. But the most successful thing we've been able to do is that Mayor Peace has a long-standing relationship with the U.S. Conference of Mayors, which is the nonpartisan association of cities with populations over 30,000. And for the last 13 years, mayors, the U.S. Conference of Mayors has adopted very strong, increasingly strong Mayors for Peace resolutions. Um, this year, in June, the resolution was adopted calling on the administration and Congress to step back from the brink and exercise global leadership in preventing nuclear war. And it's, it's a long, comprehensive resolution. I think there are copies up there. It happened to be adopted on the eve of the Singapore summit, and the resolution welcomed the and encouraged the diplomatic opening with Korea. It also supports the, J the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal. Um, it expresses regret, deep regret, that the United States and the eight other nuclear armed states boycotted last year's negotiations on the ban treaty and urges the U.S. government to embrace the ban treaty as a welcome step toward negotiation of a comprehensive agreement on the achievement and permanent maintenance of a world free of nuclear arms. Noting that, and it goes farther now into more military spending, noting that in 2017, the United States spent $610 billion on its military, more than two and a half times as much as China and Russia combined, amounting to 35% of world military spending and that this huge amount is slated to rise significantly in coming years. The U.S. Conference of Mayors calls on the President and Congress to reverse federal spending priorities and to redirect funds currently allocated to nuclear weapons and unwarranted military spending to support safe and resilient cities and to ba meet basic human needs. And finally, the question referred to back from the brink, the U.S. Conference of Mayors calls on the United States to lead a global effort to prevent nuclear war by renouncing the option of using nuclear weapons first, ending the sole unchecked authority of any president to launch a nuclear attack, taking U.S. nuclear weapons off here, trigger alert, canceling the plan to replace its entire arsenal with enhanced weapons, and acti actively pursuing a verifiable agreement among nuclear armed states to eliminate their nuclear arsenals. So the U.S. Conference of Mayors is a very well-respected and influential body. Um, it's America's main street. Now, resolutions adopted become official US, uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors policy. Uh, they do have a lobbying operation, but unfortunately, they're not lobbying on this, and they should be. But this resolution um, incorporates the pillars of the Back from the Brink campaign. It also incorporates elements designed to support the Divest from the War Machine campaign, which is a code pink campaign, and also the Ban Treaty Compliance campaign. So it's really designed to be, and should be used as an organizing tool. The cities of Los Angeles and Baltimore, among big cities and smaller cities, Amherst, um, East Palo Alto, Menlo Park, have adopted resolutions in support of the U.S. Conference of Mayors resolution Mayors of Peace Resolution and Mayors of Peace and incorporating those back from the brink provisions, which also address what I referenced earlier, which is that we need to be advocating for risk reduction measures hand in hand with elimination of nuclear weapons. So one of the things, how many of you are from San Francisco? Almost everybody, that's what I thought. So I would like to um, suggest that you consider getting the city of San Francisco to adopt one of these resolutions. And I can certainly you know, assist with, with providing model resolutions and so on. Um, one thing that you could try to do, and this is going farther, but there is one city, um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, 
who city council voted to divest the city's pension funds a billion dollars from nuclear weapons makers. And um, that is another, a much more, a, a, an approach that has more teeth for sure. But just in general, there are a lot of things that mayors for peace cities can do. There are art exhibits, they can plant seedlings from A-bomb trees in a public place, they can host town hall meetings, they can host film showings and so on. And I put together a Mayor's for Peace Action Toolkit, which there should be some copies of back there. Um, so I'd like to just urge everybody to think about that as one avenue for raising public awareness, because that is our biggest problem. And I have to totally agree with you, Ray, on the media. Um, I just came back from the UN. <laughs> and how many of you know that last Wednesday was the UN International Day for the Total Elimination of Nuclear Weapons? Oh, very good. But not everybody. Did you read about it in your newspapers? No. Did you have any idea that 56 governments, high-level representatives, including presidents, presidents and foreign ministers, spoke in a high-level plenary in support of the total elimination of nuclear weapons, and that among the nuclear-armed states, there were only three, India, China, and Pakistan, who have their own um, sort of distorted <laughs> views on their support for, their alleged support for eliminating nuclear weapons. Um, it was most of the countries from Latin America who are already members of the Treaty of Tlatelolco, the world's first nuclear weapon free zone in a populated area. Countries from Africa, which are mem members of the Treaty of Pelindaba, the African nuclear weapon free zone, and uh, Pacific Island nations who were in the Treaty of Rarotonga, and most of them were expressing their support for the Ban Treaty. Um, but again, it was very noticeable who was there and who wasn't there. And the UN was crawling with international media. And I always have this very weird sense when I go for the opening week of the General Assembly, there's this huge security zone, there's massive amounts of international media, and in most, countries of the world, this is a big deal. This is the story for this week. It's a top line story. And for us, we don't know about it. We did hear that Trump spoke, but that's about all we heard. So I like to, if I may make a joke, I'm comparing my, my um, angst about this, about people here not hearing about this, which they need to be hearing. The International Day for the Total Elimination of Nuclear Weapons was followed immediately the next day by the International Day for Political Pornography, as I have named the Kavanaugh hearing, which the whole world was glued to, you know? So, but anyway, please do find out about Mayors for Peace and, and contact me if we can figure out how to make something happen in your city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, there was a nuts and bolts question that I think is very good, that has been hinted at um, several times so far. If the control of politics has been manipulated, do we not need first to use new systems of government taking advantage of technology to allow hybrid direct democracy at the local, national, and international level in other words, the system itself must be changed with outreach to conservatives who are not militaristic. Now this reminds me of the libertarian movement um, and many other conservatives who um, strictly adhere to the idea, it's called isolationism sometimes, that America should not be um, in everybody else's business, which requires that we have enough clout to beat them over the head and respect us. So um, my, my take on this is that how do we break through these sanctions that are put on people? Why are there sanctions on Russia? Why are there sanctions on North Korea? Why are there sanctions on, on Iran? And how do we, as citizens who want to, I mean, Code Pink has organized women going to Iran. How can we get through this? And maybe there um, is something that, Ray can tell us how we can slip under the radar of, you know, what looks to me 
like um, a very unfriendly CIA coup of, <laughs> of our system right now. I mean, and the media is playing right into it. So, um, I don't know, we need, we need to devise some kind of practical measures to become citizens again and not just sports fans and con consumers and uh, people on, on sandy beaches. <laughs> Tough one. Um, the, the bottom line is how can we become more active? Or, well, I have my own little uh, peculiar outlook on that, is, and that is we have to put our bodies into it, that uh, we have an advantage, as I said before, because we're, because we're uh, uh, old, <laughs> some of us, and uh, we need to to tell people what the state, what the stakes are, and I think, um, I think the uh, history has a lot of reason, a lot of lessons for us, specifically with respect to Iran. Now, Bush and Cheney were fully intending to strike Iran during their last year in office, 2008. Thankfully, there was an honest manager of national intelligence who did a bottom-up assessment of where Iran was and the conclusion was unanimous with high confidence that Iran stopped working on a nuclear weapon at the end of 2003 and had not resumed work. Now, George Bush, uh, in his memoir, oh, he must have written this himself, he says, this was a eye popper. Uh, this would deprive me of the military option for how could I authorize this military strike on a country that the intelligence community says has no active nuclear weapons program? Bummer! <laughs> you know, <laughs> what, would have, what would have been the normal reaction? Call the Israelis, this is terrific news. This, so they're not working on it. Oh man, call the Israelis right away. Who should sell them? Pop out the champagne. Wow. But no, no. Uh, it was really, you have to read, they're about five, five pages. He must, I think he wrote it himself, and it just shows that this was what they intended to do. So I think that's an example, and it's an example that was thwarted by an honest manager of national intelligence. His name was Tom Finger. We gave him the Sam Adams Award for intelligence, in, for integrity and intelligence. And uh, people need to know that people can do these things and that they don't have to accept all the, all the propaganda and all that kind of stuff, especially on Iran, because, you know, people say, well, Iraq, Iran, well, if we were to take on Iran, it would make Iraq look like a, you know, like a volleyball game between Mount St. Ursula and, and St. Rose Academy, you know, I mean, the, the Iran, Iran is big and Iran can really hurt us and Iran can stop the oil. Iran can do all kinds of stuff and our European allies know that. So now we do need to talk this up and cite precedent because there is this precedent. Now, is there a honest manager of national intelligence now? I don't know. I don't know. I would be surprised if there were because I know who's heading up that agency and she's the torturer in chief, and I don't really see how she would do anything honest like that. Uh, I mean, it'd be great if she fooled me. Just a couple of things to add. Um, I love the idea of grassroots democracy, and I do think that that is our challenge and our hope. And I love the idea of reaching out um, politically. Um, I do a lot of speaking. And let me tell you, Livermore is not exactly the hotbed of progressivism. And it does not matter to whom I am speaking. When people understand what's going on in their name and with their money, they become upset. And to some extent, some of the Republicans with whom I um, have spoken or who have come up to me after I've given a talk actually feel the most betrayed and the most angry. 
So I do think beyond rhetoric that there is a lot of hope in reaching out to people as people and talking about these issues. The one part that gave me pause, and I don't have an answer, so I'll ask it as a challenge, was the part that you read about using new technology and new ways to solve this problem. Um, technology and I are frenemies. Um, I, I, I use it, but I try not to be used by it. And so in turning to technology as the answer, I am a little bit worried that as a society we're moving toward being used by our technologies. Um, a la 2001 A Space Odyssey, sort of. Um, and so I want to myself promote the human to human part of transforming, of creating that deep, deep transformational and political change. And to the extent that technology can be used by us, fine. But let's always look at whether it's using us. Jeanette, there was also another issue, which was about sanctions. Just real briefly, sanctions are wrongly understood by most people because of the way they're, they're talked about as being diplomacy, right? Sanctions are not diplomacy. Sanctions, for the most part, are weapons. And most of the people who suffer from the sanctions are people, are ordinary people, just like us. So we need to be very clear when we're advocating for diplomacy that we are not advocating for sanctions, that we mean actual diplomacy. America, thank you. Okay, and maybe we'll, we'll just do one more. That, um, like some of the things that are on these pages have been covered in the questions that we had so far. But um, let's see. There is, uh, okay. Well, this is, you know, this is rather heartbreaking because I experience this myself. I have children who, have, who are millennials. And um, I believe that they grew up in front of screens that showed the harmless use of explosions as exciting, where you could play video games and die many times over and still come back. And then there is this push from the army on every sporting event to try to get people to put their bodies in as the, you know, the meat on the machine. So um, this question is, why has nuclear holocaust dropped off the progressive agenda in large parts? Why has the so-called progressive community offered so little support for the Helsinki summit and the follow up to come. And um, this, you know, involves the entire crazy Russia phobia brainwash that's going on in most of Congress. How these people can be paying themselves a salary and collecting health care, you know, while they're wasting our money and our time on this crap. But anyway, that's me editorializing. <laughs> little sliver of it and leave you some of the uh, international policy implications of the question. Um, the little sliver of it that I want to tell as a story is this. After the announced end of the Cold War, um, and no, notice I say the announced end of the Cold War, um, I had progressives, including folks who were arrested at the gates of Livermore Lab, coming up to me in the early 90s and saying, aren't you happy? And I said, well, yes, I'm pretty happy. Um, can you explain your question? And they said, well, you know, we don't, nuclear weapons are not an issue anymore. <laughs> They actually thought that at the end of the Cold War that somehow nuclear weapons went away. And I have spent every day since trying to explain that nuclear weapons left the six o'clock news. They did not leave the country. 
and they shouldn't have left our consciousness. And I think that uh, it's a challenge to bring it back. So part of the answer of why, I mean, I went and um, I was very happy to be an, uh, an invited speaker earlier this year at the California, Strait, uh, California State Green Convention. And but mo many, many of the Greens um, uh, did not know very much about nuclear weapons. They were a natural constituency for a message of abolition of nuclear weapons, but they were not particularly well informed. And I am not by any means trying to um, diss um, the Greens or, or call them out. I'm offering that as an example of speaking in progressive audiences where they're very moved once they know. And so that is part of the reason why the progressives are not working on this issue is they do not understand that it is an issue. Well, it is, uh, it is thus. And uh, the mainstream media, of course, is the culprit. Um, it, I've never seen it so bad. Um, the biggest, I've been in Washington 55 years now. And if you see a lot of change in 55 years, the biggest change uh, by far is the fact that we no longer have a free media that is big. Now, here's uh, um, Trump going off to Helsinki, right? And New York Times, Washington, but, oh, he's gonna give the house, he's gonna give the, the, the shop away, he's gonna give him, he's gonna, oh, it's gonna go awful. He gets, uh, stands up with, with Putin, and um, somebody asks him that loaded question. And he, he's his own worst enemy to that analyst. And you say, well, you know, and Mr. Putin says they didn't meddle, and uh, Mr. Clapper says they probably did. So, whoa, headline in the New York Times the next day. Maybe you saw it. Trump standing with Putin criticizes U.S. intelligence. Oh, criticizes U.S. intelligence. Oh, U.S. intelligence has never been wrong. I mean, progressives have taken the CIA under their wing, for Pete's sake, because Trump doesn't like, like the CIA. So, you know, it's really the most bizarre set of circumstances. And what we would look for in progressives is uh, to, to home in on these precisely these issues, uh, and instead they're doing this Russia Gates sort of thing, purely political, and uh, you know, a legend, and uh, I don't know what's gonna happen now, but um, the election is coming, and uh, we'll see. Uh, I don't think it's gonna win them, mo win them a lot, so. People are just so distracted, they don't know what to believe. I go up to New York, my, it's where I lived, it's where I grew up, see my old friends, and they say, what government? Where do you get this stuff? I said, what do you mean? Well, it's not in the New York Times. <laughs> I, I'm serious. You know? And the same thing is it used to be in the New York Times. You know, 40 years ago, if I read the New York Times every day, I was pretty well informed. Now, forget about it. So that's really, really hard to say, but it's reality. So we have to make sure that we guide people to websites like, uh, oh, I would recommend raymcgovern.com. <laughs> if, if you don't get it, you don't get it. Um, no, I, I, I pour my life's blood into that thing, okay? My son set it up in LA and he peoples it, he you know, puts the stuff in there. And if you, if you read that and if you read consortiumnews.com, you can get pretty well informed and uh, and you're not left to the whim of, uh, of, uh, of these uh, commentators. I would like to add to that a grassroots observation, which is based on the fact that we've been leafleting here about the nuclear weapons ban for a long time. We get responses from members of the public, and some of the members of the public say, they want nuclear weapons because they think it makes them safer 
And I think we need to recognize that and they need to be educated that they are not. Mm -hmm. The best antidote for that is uh, Daniel Ellsberg's book, yeah. The Doomsday Machine. I do want to um, add a, a two-finger um, to what's going on in the media. Um, that's what I did in the 70s before I became executive director at Tri-Valley Cares. And in the 70s, we were concerned about the consolidation of the media in fewer and fewer and fewer um, corporate hands. and. You know how you think maybe you're just a little radical and it, poss it isn't that bad? It's actually much worse. A very small number of corporations own most of the news outlets. And, and they have fewer reporters. The, I talked to a friend of mine who's a longtime reporter at the New York Times. And at one point he said they had 25% fewer reporters and now it's 40% you know, fewer reporters. And one small thing that my organization has done, you, know, you look at what can you do to counter it, and I'll, um, I'll commend it to your attention, is every month we write letters to the editor. So if there aren't enough reporters to cover our issues, we cover them in snippets, letters to the editor are short, but they get published a lot. And your letters can get published a lot. And so consider, for example, um, the Contra Costa Times chain out in the East Bay where I am. I don't remember right now the exact circulation, but it's about 500,000. And it's free to write a letter and to submit it, and it will often get published. So just imagine that you get to talk to 500,000 people for free. Mm -hmm. So seriously think about utilizing that tool. It's not a complete answer. We need you know, much more political and social change. But consider it's a tool you have today that you can use that will do some good. In a wind up of this meeting, I would just like to say that in the bright hope of addressing this question, in 2016, the Coalition um, for Nuclear Disarmament was formed. Now, so far, it's still in its infancy. It really needs to move forward. We need to get it a website, and I believe we need a bi-coastal presence. But we need an engaged presence of people all over the country. So if you have relatives in other places, you can let them know that we're working on this. And um, also, if you know people who are in academia, you can let them know that this is a very important issue to you, that you would like to see the planet survive and thrive, and you would like to see the resources that you pour into your taxes every year be used for something to benefit you and to um, enhance your experience as a human being in this country and the lives and welfare of your children and not some bogus sense of safety from the boogeyman who doesn't exist. The boogeyman is in Washington and it's not just Trump. It's all of these people that are doing this song and dance that um, just leaves the military and the bankers who are enriched by the military and the fables of the military in charge of our resources and in charge of our future. So um, we need to find our collective voice and please consider joining the Warren Law League. Join with all of the members, uh, member organizations that we have. Uh, some of them are nationwide. I know David Swanson is based on the East Coast. I know Code Pink is everywhere. Please work through these organizations to be part of, um, of the coalition. We're going to build this thing and we're going to raise awareness, but we have to do it as a group. We can't just be a few, the, you know, the few and the proud, the, you know. We have to be loud and proud, and we have to convince everyone that this is a worthwhile cause, at least as worthwhile as celebrities and the, um, the disparate, identity political movements.
So um, anyway, I'm going to wind up the meeting here. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for participating. Sign up with the War and Law League. We hope to continue to exist. One thing that I might not have um, mentioned is that this is the 20th anniversary of the War and Law League. And so um, we would like to continue into the future. We have con committees that are forming. Please sign up on your way out. And uh, we have nominal dues of $10 a year. But your active participation is worth more than all the money in the world. So thank you. Thank you. One, one more call.